afternoon, Cascade Media Group family. I'm your host, Glenn Bryan Frizzell. Today we are interviewing the sixth president of historic Xavier University in Louisiana, Dr. C. Reynolds Verrett. Thank you for joining What's Up Kansas City Cascade Media Group, the HBCU presidential series today, Dr. Verrett. How's it going? I'm happy to be with you. Uh, we are doing well. Uh, we're now getting ready for our the entry of classes and we're making sure that we have what we need to have in place, including making sure that the entry is safe. Now you have a background in uh, biochemistry. How is COVID affecting the campus life there? Well, it, it's affecting the campus life in that even as we are returning, we are making sure that we have, the, that we are making sure people are safe. So that means life is a little different. We are requiring everyone to be vaccinated coming up except for those who have certain key legal exceptions. Uh, a vaccinated campus will allow us to actually not be transmitting uh, around the campus. Uh, the other piece that we we'll probably will do, given that we have a variant there, we will probably have to retain our masks sometimes. So it, it, indoors. it's best to keep everybody safe is what I'm hearing. Yeah, it, for us, yeah, it's not just about keeping myself safe, but also make sure I, I'm not a threat to anyone else. Now it's not gonna affect any of the academic or, or student life. I... On the academic life, the ac academic life, we are returning to class in person. We had classes in person before. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have everyone in the, in res the uh, residential. I apologize. Um, the academic life, uh, pardon, me, pardon me for that. The no, academic no. life is not, it, it will not be affected. We will be having our class mainly in person, somewhat different from last year. We are returning to our residential facilities, but what we in, in there will require that if no one in our residential facility can be unvaccinated. So you'd have to be vaccinated to be to, to live in the, in the residential spaces. That that's something different from than, 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 than we've had before because COVID was not an issue. Um, so in 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 that in that we will still be requiring masking. So in other words, and probably we will probably be careful about any large gatherings until we get some clearance on what's happening with the the Delta variant. Now, Xavier University in Louisiana is historic in the sense that it's the only black Catholic university in uh, America, United States. What are some highlights? Uh, I understand the university's celebrating or going into its 96th year. What are some of the, the highlights uh, aspect of, of, of campus life going on uh, Xavier right now? Well, uh, at Xavier right now, the campus is definitely just preparing, but uh, the highlights in Xavier is that we are preparing for our centennial in, 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 in only a few years. Mm -hmm. um, depending on how, how where you define the start. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, the, the highlights of Xavier is, that is, is the quality of education. We are still educating more African Americans who become physicians in this country than, than any school in the country. We are one of the leading uh, African American producers of, of students who go on to doctoral programs in, in, in the sciences, all the STEM fields, science and engineering, um, and that fluctuates one or two. We are clearly sending the numbers of lawyers, uh, federal judges, uh, if you think of lawyers who are representing uh, uh, families in some significant cases around the country as we are dealing with our social justice issues, some of Xavier graduates. So we're educating students and pushing them hard. Xavier is a challenging university. Uh, we challenge students and when they finish, they become the equal of anyone else. So education for us is our primary piece. We also have uh, excellent athletics programs. Uh, you may have read recently about the return of baseball to Xavier. Uh, that, 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 that was a very big thing, something that would have been wished upon us speak by Hank Aaron. He, he, he encouraged us to bring baseball back here and he missed it by a few weeks on the, uh, our, our opening game. Uh, we have uh, great athletes in Xavier. At the same time, our, our athletes are, are, are student athletes, they're scholars. Our, some of our athletes go on to, they go to law school, they go on to uh, uh, graduate programs in the sciences. So these are some kick-ass students that, that we educated Xavier. And we push them, we push them hard, they push each other. At the same time, one of the things that is really has to do with our historically black and Catholic culture is the notion of service. Our students are of service, not only to people outside, but to each other. So it's not about that I get across the finish line first, it's that we all get across the finish line. That the way our students support each other is, is something that, the, that, that they understand that they pass on to the next generation of students coming in every year. That's awesome. Um, I understand this is coming from the gold rush and gold nuggets. Um, what uh, would a, pop, a student who's thinking about attending the University of Xavier, Xavier University, what would they have to look forward to uh, specifically this year? Well, uh, the, 
the one major piece this year that, 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 they, that, that they would say at least at least from the beginning of the semester until we know better is that we will be masking. Uh, we will be asking them not just to be vaccinated against the, the normal diseases that, that, that students must be vaccinated on, on, for example, on chicken pox, measles, that students normally bring their vaccinations on. We, we, we're adding COVID-19 as, as a necessity in the middle of this emergency. So they would have to be vaccinated. The other piece that, that, that will be important is that we will be wearing our masks for the for, for, for a period until, until, we get, until we get clarity about that. Other than that, the campus life will be going on will be vibrant. Uh, our, our courses will be as much as they would expect, and we will help them get to where to, uh, to, uh, to where they want to go, where they, where they dream. Uh, so in many ways, we are returning somewhat to the pre-pandemic model, but we're not turning our attention away from the pandemic yet. I want to learn more about this uh, Louisiana culture you mentioned, Dr. Vera. What, what's what's unique about being able to attend college, not only a, a black college, uh, Catholic university dedicated to service, but being in Louisiana? Well, and, and, and not just being, being in this part of Louisiana. Uh, New Orleans is, uh, is, is, to use a, 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 a statement of Mark Twain, to paraphrase Mark Twain, there are three cities in the United States that no matter where you go around the world, people know about them. They know about New York. They may know about Chicago, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and they surely know about New Orleans. And New Orleans is the smallest one. New Orleans is an iconic city that with its own brand because not only you, we know of, of the music, the jazz that, that, that New Orleans has produced, but it goes into other areas of music, including bounce, take your pick. But it's the arts, in the arts generally, the large number of artists who, who, have, who have come out of New Orleans, right? But also the way it has defined American culture uh, even from this, before the Civil War. Uh, New Orleans is not, people think of New Orleans as a Southern city, right? But I'm going to ask you to take another look. New Orleans is a, is a Caribbean city. New Orleans is not like, it's, it, it, it's near Alabama, it's near Georgia, but New Orleans is not like the cities in Georgia or Alabama. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. New Orleans is a little like us in, in some ways. Uh, New Orleans uh, uh, brings, ha, is, a, is a city where many cultures have come together. If you think about New Orleans as a, a city where, yes, the French were there uh, initially, a lot of French Creole blacks were there initially, uh, Greeks came, Italians came, uh, and that all shows up in our food. The Vietnamese are, are, are a community that, that, that have come to, Z to New Orleans in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, the, the, children, the boat people who, who came, came to this area. Now they are New Orleans. In fact, Vietnamese cuisine is, has, become, has begun mixing in New Orleans cuisine. In fact, uh, the large, a large fraction of our students at Xavier, I'm talking about almost 10 to 12% of our students are Asians. Many of them, the majority of the students are, are children of, the Vietnam, of that Vietnamese community who have come to know and love us, okay? Because they become New Orleans. That mixing gives us a lot. In fact, there's a saying that many people have come to New Orleans to become the great people they are. For example, I'll take an example of someone like Tennessee Williams. Tennessee Williams did not become Tennessee Williams until he came to New Orleans. <laughs> because it was New Orleans that helped shape him to be, uh, 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 to be and you'll see musicians, artists, scientists as well. So New Orleans, and New Orleans, the fact that that openness to uh, to Latin and Central America, the same as openness to the Upper Mississippi, is what is what shapes New Orleans. That that that, that the encounter of cultures here that, that occurs here, and because of that, I think it's an eye opener for students who come from afar. Uh, because it changes you to, uh, to live in this environment that you become, you discover people who are not like my neighbors in Minneapolis or in uh, New York City even, I'm from Brooklyn, so I can tell you that. It, uh, it's, you, you, you realize that, that, that you've come to a place that is distinct from most of uh, other parts of the United States. And I saw Dr. Fair, I, I wanted to back up just a little bit. I like what you said earlier about it's not just about me, but it's about creating a culture that helps my fellow brother, my student, uh, uh, who's younger than me, get across the finish line as well. And at Cascade Media Group, we're all about student success. I kind of want to shift direction just a little bit and talk about the importance of HBCUs. I don't know if you had a chance to see the article that I sent you. Uh, it was entitled, While Howard University Rides a Wave of Acclaim, Some Black Colleges Are Struggling. This came from the Chicago Sun-Times, July 15th, 2021. I'm and, aware of the article. And basically, Dr. Verrett, it said the cumulative endowment for all historical black colleges through 2019 was a little over 3.9 billion. That's about equal to the endowment for the University of Minnesota alone. I was surprised when I read that. I think it's kind of a window to what's going on in uh, the black community at large um, to kind of compliment that the Urban League uh, released their Black State of America report re recently. 
And according to data from um, the Federal Reserve Bank's 2019 survey, the typical African-American household has less than 15% of the median wealth of the typical mm -hmm. white household, 24,000 versus 188,000 and some change. Dr. Barrett, how important are college endowments and what methods do we proactively take to increase financial capital and wealth of our black institutions? College endowments are, are, are important for a number of reasons. One is that they do stabilize budgets, but, I, but I'm, I'm gonna take it to, to, to a larger piece. A large fraction of college endowments includes scholarships for students, mm -hmm. especially need-based scholarships, not just scholarships for, for the students with the highest GPA, highest SATs, but Very for the important. good student who also, whose families are not as rich. And understand at HBCUs, our students are predominantly from the lower two-fifths of the socioeconomic ladder of this country, right? Well, not, our students are not wealthy students, so they come with needs. Mm -hmm. And those needs cannot be easy, satisfied easy by saying, your mother or father should take out a loan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So resources to support students are crucial to, uh, to the success and perseverance of our students. That's, that's important. In other places, college endowments also support our buildings. For example, deferred maintenance at, at, at HBCUs. HBCUs on the average are 100 or plus, right? Buildings are old. They need repair. They need to be repurposed. That that deferred maintenance uh, 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 on HBCU campus is, is is a significant bill. In fact, there's a recent article showing that the deferred maintenance total for the United States alone for all American colleges is somewhere around three four billion dollars. That's the bill. Uh, and if you subtract out the very wealthy schools, then you still probably a couple billion dollars among uh, in in the middle to less wealthy more wealthy schools. So that challenge alone is significant to, to sustain our campuses, to almost to help students afford what we do at HBCUs, given the success and return investment of, of HBCUs. That's, that's the piece, but the endowment is very important. I, I agree with you completely. The fact that the disparity in wealth between the African-American population, the descendants of slaves and the rest of America shows up in the giving capacity of those families and, and institutions. And not understanding that it's not that the disparity in wealth is not because of lack of enterprise or work, but there were significant barriers that were placed in front of African Americans to acquiring wealth. For example, Woodrow Wilson elimination of, 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 this, of blacks from the civil service. Over a hundred years, that cascades down to significant wealth differential. The uh, fact that the, the 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 federal housing laws are under Roosevelt. Essentially, the federal housing laws eliminate from that black communities. In other words, that's what the red line is. So that communities that, that had whites and blacks intermixed drew interesting little lines to separate out the black people so that they could, be, uh, they, they could qualify for the FHA loans. A house is really the greatest, the largest source of wealth for the average American family, right? Definitely. So the housing in some communities went way, way up because of, because, of, because of that loan pro program. Mm -hmm. For African Americans, they actually went down. That cascade after 70, 100 years, right? That has an impact. So, so the, the differentiating wealth, the, the intention, the intentionalities of closing certain doors to wealth from African American ramifies into what you see in endowments at HBCUs. Nonetheless, the requirement that we have, the need that we have to sustain what we do and, and what and we do it very well, to raise funds for and for endowments for for the important key aspects of our mission. It's crucial. So we need to we we pursue donors actively because that need is not about is not about the students of today. It's about students that are to come. In fact, we've had a discussion very often among my students, my alumni, everyone. See, like who does the university belong to? Right? It doesn't actually belong to students who have not come yet. That's and we have to actually make sure this is here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it all, and it, and it continues to belong to those who have not come yet. Always. Mm -hmm. So we have we have we have to look we have to sustain what we do in the future for the future because the future the future uh, uh, of our of our communities and of, and of the American people are uh, are required. Very good, uh, Dr. Barry. Do you have any final words uh, for our listeners? Well, I I, I would put frame the uh, changes that we've seen in the American society, even our demographics, as an important. Uh, signal for, for for not just for H, for, for HBCUs or for the African American community, but for America as, as a whole. As a country becomes 
black and brown demographically, as we become majority minority. The fact that the majority of third graders and now fourth graders are black and brown. That's the future of the country. Therefore, the talent that we need in order to sustain this country as a great nation requires that we educate those black and brown kids. Not just at college level, but in the second, third, fourth grade. They are, they are the strength, they are, they are the gold for this country. If you don't tap that gold, right, you risk becoming something less than, 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 than you are. So we all have an interest in the success of HBCUs and of the quality PK through 12 education that the country needs. Thank you, Dr. Vera. Certainly our, uh, we extend our, um, condol not condolence, we extend uh, our best wishes for a, a successful school year. Uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought here at Cascade Media Group, the HBCU Presidential Series. Hopefully we can check back in with you uh, in a not determined time to see, uh, again, the great things the uh, Gold Rush, Gold Nuggets are up to. Uh, I'm your host, Glenn Frizzell, here at Cascade Media Group, the HBC Presidential Series. Remember, shoot for the moon. If you miss it, the very least, you would have landed among the stars. Take care until next time. Well put. Thank you. This is brought to you by Africana Art.